why we should focus on people with serious mental illness from an economics perspective. What, what sort of, what does the economic lens tell us about this particular population group? Um, so what I'd also like to focus on then is how do we define people with SMI? What is the prevalence of people with SMI? What are the direct and indirect costs associated with the illness? And what are some of the challenges for policymakers in terms of trying to, to, to deal in from a policy perspective with this particular population group? And what are the care processes and do they improve outcomes? So that's the sort of broad outline of what I'd like to talk, to talk about, um, focusing on some of the work that we've been doing um, uh, and uh, as well as the work of various uh, other colleagues contributing to this space. So in terms of thinking about why we should focus on people with SMI from an economics perspective, uh, probably the biggest um, reason would be that um, people living with SMI experience uh, some of the worst inequalities with a life expectancy of up to 20 years less than the general population. This is the life expectancy that, well, the general population would have experienced in the 1950s. So it's, it's a huge inequality and this excess premature mortality gap is in fact increasing. So this just shows a sort of a picture of the um, how we might, uh, the, the distri distribution, if you like, of this excess premortal premature mortality as a percentage between uh, the period 2016 to 2018. Um, and if we were to assume that there was absolutely no inequality between individuals with SMI and the general population, we'd have an uh, excess premature mortality rate of 0%. Uh, but we actually find that people with SMI have an excess premature mortality rate of around 365%, which means that they're, it's, they're four and a half times more likely to die prematurely than those who do not have SMI. Um, for women, that figure is around four and a half, and for, sorry, for men, it's around four and a half times, and for women, it's around 4.7 times, five times. So, and there's a huge amount of geographic variation. We can see um, some of the variation spread around the, some of the more urban areas. Um, so very high levels of excess mortality um, uh, and high levels of, of variation across, um, across the geographic areas. Um, we can also see this changing over time. So between the period 2015 to 2017, uh, compared to 2016 to 2018, that um, premature mortality has gone up from 355% for all persons to 365% for all persons. So uh, that's an increase of around 10 percentage points. Uh, for males, it's gone up from 356 to 365, so around nine percentage points. And for females, from 364 to 374 percentage points over this time period. So again, huge um, levels of excess mortality there uh, relative to, to the general population. So this mortality gap is driven to a very large extent by what we might call a morbidity gap. So one of the reasons people die prematurely um, is because they are at a much higher risk. They have five times higher prevalence of having multiple long-term conditions, three or more long-term conditions, physical health conditions. <clears throat> and we know that around two out of three are, of the premature uh, deaths are associated with physical ill health, uh, which are preventable. So there's a whole multitude of reasons for having this poorer physical health, um, and these relate to wider social factors such as socioeconomic <clears throat> deprivation, unemployment and poverty, a whole range of health behaviours that, uh, that, that pose risks such as smoking and poor diet, uh, the effects of side effects from medication, which often lead to huge amounts of weight gain, um, a lack of support to access care, um, as well as stigma and discrimination, so a, a, a lack of help seeking, and then also diagnos diagnostic overshadowing, which essentially means that the, the sort of misattribution um, of physical health symptoms, which are sort of ascribed to, to the mental health diagnosis. 
So related to this mor morbidity gap, this just uh, is a graph showing this um, excess risk, if you like, associated with a variety of different uh, long-term conditions. So people with severe mental illness in the age group 15 to 74 are 1.8 times more likely to uh, have uh, obesity, 1.9 times more likely to suffer from diabetes, 2.1 times more likely to have COPD and so on. Uh, and as I said, a number of these are preventable physical illnesses. Um, and particularly for the age group 15 to 34, so that younger age group, um, people with SMI uh, have much higher risks, even more so. So, for example, three times more likely to have uh, obesity, 3.7 times more likely to have diabetes, and so on. So those premature deaths um, are uh, the result of a range of conditions. Um, as we said, two out of these three deaths um, are, are, are these uh, premature deaths are as a result of physical illnesses, and they're particular, particularly high levels of high in health inequalities for things like liver disease and respiratory disease. Even though the majority of people with SMI die from cardiovascular disease, uh, the, the inequalities are particularly stark for liver disease and respiratory disease. So people with um, SMI have much higher rates of health risk factors. Um, we know that there's social factors and stresses which can impact on people's psychological well-being, and um, some of these health behaviors may be perceived as sort of coping strategies. Um, and smoking is probably one of the still is one of the single largest causes of preventable death in England. Um, while the smoking prevalence for the general population is probably at an all-time low. Um, people with SMI um, are probably three times more likely to, um, to smoke and yet be much less likely to give in support to quit smoking. We know that antipsychotic medications um, can cause metabolic disorders and huge amounts of weight gain, particularly in the first six months. Um, and that gain uh, is particularly so with certain antipsychotics like clozapine and olanzapine. And on average, people can put on around 7% um, of their weight of their, against their in, um, start weight. Um, we know that um, people with um, SMI um, be, experience these significantly high levels of risk, um, and they therefore should be offered um, health assessments for early detection of physical health problems. Um, but while that's improving, these rates are still relatively low. Um, so the National Clinical Audit of Psychosis found that um, less than half of patients still have all their five major health risks monitored. So I'll talk a little bit more about the work that we've been doing around um, physical health checks in a little while. So why should economists care about this? Well, if that mortality gap and that morbidity gap is not enough to... Uh, to signal the importance of this particular area, then I think, oh gosh, I apologize, this has come up in the wrong order. But um, there are these significant inequalities, as I said. So people with psychosis are probably four, 15 times at a higher risk of being homeless, nine times higher risk of living in the lowest quintile household income, so in poverty. They're much likely, more likely to live alone or experience social isolation. And they're more likely to live in less uh, safe neighborhoods. Now, we know that good quality, stable employment can be protective for people's mental health, yet people with SMI um, have around 67 percentage point lower um, employment rates relative to uh, the general population, yet less than half are likely to get um, unemployment support. We know this from the, um, the National Clinical Audit of Psychosis. So what does this mean? Well, this means that um, people um, who are out of employment, we will, the, it has economic consequences. There will be reduced tax, receipt, tax receipts, reduced consumption expenditure, increased welfare payments, lost productivity through um, absenteeism and presenteeism. So it has a big um, impact on the economy. And that's, of course, why economists should care about it. <clears throat> 
Um, there had been a very nice study, for example, by Grieve and Nielsen in the Journal of Health Economics in 2013, which looked at uh, employment rates for people with schizophrenia. Um, and they found that even up to six years before individuals actually had their first interaction with a psychiatric care, their employment rates had already dropped and they were as low as 8%. Um, but once they've been in contact with care, the employment rate sort of stabilizes to around 18%. So uh, on top of there being all these significant health inequalities, uh, employment rates being really, really low, there are of course also impacts for the health service uh, and for the individuals themselves. So we know they experience reduced adherence to treatment, which has big knock-on effects for um, the health service. They have much longer lengths of stay, increased cost, poorer health outcomes, and a reduced quality of life. So I've talked a lot about why we should care about this particular population group. What about who they actually are? So how do we define people with SMI? So in the US, they've tended to use probably a much broader definition than we have here in the UK. Um, in the US, uh, it, it, it's, well, across the pond in, in, and, and here as well, I think that it's SMI is generally defined as, as mental and substance misuse or behavioral disorders, emotional disorders, which cause functional impairment that substantially interfere or uh, limit uh, major life activities. Um, and the sorts of disorders that tend to fall into this category include schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder, which includes um, major depression with psychotic symptoms or treatment resistant depression. But it can, of course, also include uh, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, personality disorders, and so on, if the functional impairment is severe. So we know that, of course, all mental health conditions have the potential to produce significant impairment or interfere with quality of life. But these different definitions tend to be um, used, the, the definitions depend to some extent on how, how they are used and whether it's for legal or clinical or epidemiological purposes, um, and often also for funding purposes. So for example, in the US, um, some of the federal um, uh, monies that were being uh, diverted to the states for uh, as a sort of um, block uh, funding, depended on the type of definition that they came up with. And they found that the majority of people who met that sort of functional impairment definition were individuals with these particular diagnostic categories. So schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder and bipolar disorder, which is why they, that tends to be the, that we've now tend to define things by, um, uh, <clears throat> by disease rather than by the, the functional level of functional impairment. So in the UK, we've got the similar um, definition of disorders that are debilitating and that cause serious functional occupational impairment. But our definition here has been a lot narrower. So we've largely based it on reporting of individuals um, who are um, uh, uh, identified on a primary care general practice register. And that register is incentivized through the quality and outcomes framework. So GPs actually receive these QOF payments to maintain this register. Um, but the definition is really quite tight. It includes individuals with schizophrenia, bipolar affective disorder, and other psychoses, as well as patients on lithium therapy. So of course, how we define SMI will give rise to very different prevalence rates. So what is the prevalence? Well, for um, the US, as we might expect, we have a much uh, higher prevalence estimate. So this is these two sets of figures come from the US from the 2020s from different sources. They give similar figures, but slightly different. So the one on the left gives a, a, a prevalence rate of around 5.6% or 14.2 million adults, whereas the, the one on the right gives a prevalence rate of about 5.2% of adults and about 13.1 million. Um, and that prevalence rate is particularly high amongst the 18 to 25 year olds, um, although the, 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 the biggest bulk of people sit within the 26 to 49 um, age category. Prevalence in the UK um, has 
we don't actually have a good prevalence estimate. Um, most of these prevalence estimates have tended to come from the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, uh, which the last one was in 2014. We were awaiting the one which took place in 2022, which was delayed due to COVID. But our best sort of estimates at the moment come probably from the COF, from the SMI registers, where we know that around 590,000 people were on the COF register in 2020. And based on population estimates that year, we well, that would give us a population prevalence of around 1.3%. But that, of course, only covers individuals who are on primary care registers, and there may be individuals who don't have any contact with primary care. Now, the problem is we don't actually have very good uh, estimates of who has SMI in secondary care because of very poor diagnostic coding uh, in the mental health services data set, which is the main data set in, in England, which captures individuals who are in contact with secondary care. So we're actually working at the moment to develop a number of algorithms so that we can identify people with um, psychosis in the MHSDS and that, that work we hope to publish a little bit later this year. Um, using uh, information from David McDade and, and colleagues at the Mental Health Foundation, um, they've used estimates from the Global Burden of Disease um, 2019 estimates, and that came up with a population, a, a population estimate of around 2.2%, um, which, which probably is a pretty reasonable. Um, and then based again on the global burden of disease estimates, that would suggest that the latest prevalence estimates from those suggested around 980 million people worldwide have a mental health condition and they estimate around 335 million people worldwide would experience SMI. I think that's probably quite a generous definition because that includes people with um, substance misuse and alcohol disorders, uh, and would suggest around a third of all, all mental health problems are serious mental illness, which probably is broader than most of the other definitions we would be familiar with. But just using the ones from the, the Mental Health Foundation, that would suggest um, this estimate of around 2% for schizophrenia um, and around 8% for bipolar disorder. But I think the thing I really want to point out to you on these prevalence estimates is just exactly the, the distribution of this um, prevalence. And you can see the majority of that falls amongst people of working age. And I think this is what why economists really should be looking and, and focused on um, mental health um, challenges because unlike physical health, um, which predominantly affects people in older age, these really affect people of working age. So they have real economic consequences. And we can see a sim similar distribution again for people with bipolar disorder. So this following graph, I think shows it really, really nicely. Um, this is um, a distribution of patients with SMI in 2018. We can see um, the green lines show the SMI patients um, over the age distribution and the white shows um, the, the, the all patients. And you can see that the, the green lines really bulging out um, over the working age groups, um, particularly so for men, but um, for women, they stretch over into the um, old age groups as well. But really, I think it shows quite nicely that um, uh, how it affects people of working age. Uh, and then a final one, just to show the distribution of the prevalence across these deprivation quintiles. So we can see that people with SMI are 1.8 times more likely to be within the most deprived deprivation quintile. Um, and this is again from 2018 figures. These next two papers look at um, prevalence, uh, again, by looking at it associated with socioeconomics in mind, as well as environmental factors. So this first paper was done by colleagues from Manchester, um, and both of these papers are using spatial models. Uh, the first one uh, looked at um, spatial prevalence uh, and showed that people in more socially fragmented and socially deprived areas more, were more likely to be diagnosed with SMI, but they found a lot of heterogeneity within and between regions. 
Uh, this second paper was actually done by myself and colleagues um, in York, and we looked um, uh, also at uh, social deprivation, but moreover, we looked at environmental factors um, and prevalence of SMI, and we found um, that individuals who live a greater distance from green spaces with lakes uh, were more likely to have SMI. Individuals who lived in areas with higher levels of air pollution, which was measured as uh, particulate matter 2.5, um, and individuals who lived closer to roads with high levels uh, of noise pollution also experienced higher levels of, of um, prevalence of SMI. But we also found a lot of heterogeneity between um, different conurbations, ur urban and uh, conurbations. Um, and these just show those two um, maps, uh, spatial maps from each of those two studies, which I think are actually very complementary uh, and show, you know, higher levels of SMI prevalence in, in, in uh, more deprived uh, urban areas, London, West Midlands, the Northwest and the very Northeast, although the Northeast is um, uh, not uh, as densely populated, uh, it, there are some real pockets there of high deprivation. So what are the uh, direct and indirect costs associated with um, SMI? So um, this first study used a micro simulation model um, by uh, Seabury and colleagues to estimate the per lifetime, um, per patient lifetime costs for SMI in the US and found that to be 1.85 million uh, US dollars. Um, and then this, the overall estimated economic impact of um, SMI is estimated to be about 320 billion pounds per year. And the important thing here is to note that while a third of that uh, is attributable to healthcare expenditures, it is absolutely trumped by this nearly 200 um, billion pound estimate of lost earnings. So all those indirect costs really, really trump the direct healthcare costs. Um, <clears throat> and that's driven by the fact that around 40% of people with SMI um, are, are employed, but around another 40% are unemployed or not in the workforce and 20% have incomes below the poverty level. So in the UK, we, uh, we know that the overall, this is again from the study from the Mental Health Foundation, they've estimated the overall economic cost of mental health in 2019 uh, at just uh, around 117 billion pounds. So that includes both uh, direct and indirect costs. Um, those include um, hospital services, drug staff, time ambulances and community care. And indirect costs include uh, reduced labor supply, as I said, um, lost productivity, premature mortality, reduced quality of life, um, and also informal care, which is a huge component. But they would also argue that they've underestimated things because they haven't included um, the managing the physical health problems from people with SMR, which we know is a really big uh, component. And it also doesn't include quality of life impacts and health impacts from self-harm and suicide. So it's probably quite conservative, but this in itself amounts to about 5% of GDP. So schizophrenia and bipolar disorder at around 9 billion and nearly 20 billion pounds together make up around 25% of that overall total mental health care cost. So just to put this all into perspective, um, total healthcare expenditure, so the total NHS budget in 2019 was around 225 billion pounds. So at 120, 118 billion pounds, call it, um, the, th that was 5% of GDP relative to 10% of GDP of the total healthcare budget. So it's a, it's a really big uh, component. So we've done a little bit of work looking at the direct um, costs of um, SMI. Uh, this was a study which we just published in Health Economics last year. Uh, this was one of the first studies where we've actually linked the entire care pathway for people with SMI across primary care, um, uh, accident and emergency, 
um, um, elective and non-elective care and, uh, and outpatient care. Um, and as you can see, really the biggest bulk, not surprisingly, comes from uh, inpatient care, but that includes physical health care. So a big component of that is the <clears throat> physical health care needs of people with SMI. And then sort of uh, secondary component, of course, is specialist mental health care. So in another study, we looked at the uh, trying to break down the proportion of costs that are related to the SMI versus the physical health care. And we can see over the different age groups, the proportion of the overall costs for people with SMI. So this again includes all the costs, primary, secondary, community, um, A&E and so on. The uh, proportions attributable to SMI goes down over time whereas the proportion that's attributable to physical health care goes up as individuals get older. So we've done a little bit of work looking at um, health care resource and use and costs for individuals specifically related to their comorbidities, to their physical health care. So, for example, this study looked at people with SMI and diabetes. So we know that people with SMI have twice the risk of type 2 diabetes, and that each condition will influence the severity of the other, so it will lead to increased resource use and costs. So we calculated the expected lifetime costs for people with uh, both SMI and type 2 diabetes as around £35,000 per person. And if we extrapolate nationally, um, that gives total annual healthcare costs of around £270 uh, per annum. So just to demonstrate the resource use and the costs um, for, for the two conditions together relative to a group with only type 2 diabetes, what we found here in this first column, well, the first column is the total cost, but this, the second uh, column is individuals with both type, type 2 diabetes and SMI, and the third column is individuals with only type 2 diabetes. Um, and we've adjusted here for um, a range of factors. So for example, age of diagnosis of type two diabetes, gender, ethnicity, um, a whole range of comorbidities, um, medications, and so on. And you can see, for example, that the, there are significant differences across the board here. So um, people with SMI and type two diabetes have much higher rates of primary care contacts, um, they have much higher um, numbers of uh, admissions for both mental health and non-mental health related um, conditions, as you might expect. Uh, a really big driver here of differences in utilization is the length of stay, which is around five times as high, um, resulting in much higher costs uh, across the board. So we've talked a bit about some of the, the direct costs and some of the indirect costs, but there are also, of course, uh, personal costs here for the individual. One of the big ones, which we don't always talk a lot about, is the cost of stigma and discrimination. So people with mental health um, face a, a, a stigma which has an economic impact, and people with serious mental illness face particularly uh, high levels, levels of stigma. And those economic uh, effects can impact on things like housing, um, how they engage with the labor market, with leisure activities, religious activities, how they <clears throat> access treatment, their health seeking behavior. And of course that can have an impact also on mortality. So we know that stigma impacts ne negatively on employment, on income uh, and on public views, on resource allocation and healthcare costs. Um, and there have been some really nice studies coming out more recently about the cost of um, the economic cost of stigma, showing that it leads to reduced GP contacts and also reduced leisure activities, in particular things like going to the pub or to restaurants and so on. So reduced consumption expenditure again, and therefore leads to welfare losses. So this is ne never helped by the the press and the media, I think, who tend to, or historically certainly have had quite um, negative stereotypes about people with serious mental illness. 
um, often portraying them as um, uh, with, with criminality and um, and violence and so on. Um, there have been a, a lot of uh, similar things in television programs and in uh, films and so on, which I think uh, again emphasise the sort of dangerous dangerousness and unpredictability. Having said that, I think there have been a lot of positive steps to addressing stigma. A lot of um, attitudes are changing. People are talking more openly about it. Um, helped along to some extent by the fact that um, physical and mental health now have parity of esteem through enshrined through the Health and Social Care Act. And we know that there are also many cost-effective interventions to combat stigma. And Graham Thornycroft has done a lot of work in the space showing that popula population level um, interventions can show short-term benefits. Um, and moreover, those, those benefits are often for the individuals themselves uh, as well, um, as well as group level interventions, which show some benefit. So what are some of the challenges for policymakers in this space? Um, probably one of the biggest ones is related to what we've been talking about. So stigma uh, can often lead to uh, or contribute to this treatment gap. So people with mental health problems, and particularly with serious mental illness, experience an enormous treatment gap. So they don't always receive treatment, or if they do, they receive inadequate levels of treatment, or, um, well, they get underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed or undertreated or inadequate treatment. So in the US, around 34% of individuals with SMI receive no treatment. Now in an in, uh, insurance-based system like that, where there's often co-payments, some of the biggest reasons for them not receiving payment include the fact that they simply can't afford it. Um, so uh, we can see that around 70% of people have health insurance that doesn't pay enough for mental health services and around 7% just don't have the coverage at all. Um, and around 12% of those with SMI, yeah, just don't have, don't have any, don't just simply lack the means. So um, and we know from uh, Rand Health Insurance Experiment many, many years ago that um, there's quite a high uh, elasticity of demand for mental health services. So people are more price responsive when it comes to mental health. So um, for example, if the price uh, or co if co-insurance rates or deductibles go up, um, people are more likely to withdraw from mental health care than from physical health care. Um, there's been a very nice recent study by uh, a PhD student in the Netherlands, um, published in Social Science and Medicine, which showed that as uh, deductibles go up, people reduce their use of mental health care. But even if there aren't financial barriers, so even in healthcare systems where care may be free at the point of access, we know that people with SMI tend to minimize contact with services, they don't seek help, um, and they tend to want to avoid the label. And yet we know that there are many cost-effective interventions available. There have been many advances in cost-effective treatments. Um, although we do need a lot more evidence on high quality uh, high quality evidence on cost effective treatments. So, for example, these are just some just a few examples of some of the interventions that we know now uh, are highly cost effective. So early intervention in psychosis is essentially where um, we know that if you intervene very early in psychotic disorders, it can reduce um, admissions, reduce length of stay, um, lead to better outcomes. Um, so some a systematic review published in 2019 showed that um, EIP services are, uh, are, can be very, very effective. Um, and, and this evidence is pretty consistent. There, there, there is um, heterogeneity across the quality of and the myth methodological quality of some of these studies, but we know by and large that uh, early intervention of psychosis is uh, cost effective. Cognitive behavior therapy is a similar one. So a very recent study coming out from the Netherlands, a randomized controlled trial showing that it, it, it is cost-effective. 
Um, and this final one, for example, individual placement support. These are trying to get individuals with serious mental illness back into employment, help them and support them to get back into work. Um, um, this particular study by uh, Christensen and colleagues coming out of Denmark, um, showing uh, again the incremental cost effectiveness ratio was, uh, I don't think it was significant, but nonetheless it was the, the overall intervention was cost reducing and uh, the, uh, the outcomes were, were very positive. So we know that this evidence is out there. The challenge for policymakers is that often when uh, they want to implement some of these uh, interventions, the costs may fall to the health system, but the benefits accrue elsewhere. Um, and this is one of my favorite slides. It's from an oldish study now by uh, Martin Knapp and colleagues um, at the LSE, but it shows essentially um, for every one pound that might be spent on a particular intervention, where those payoffs sit, and some of them might sit in health services, some of them might sit in other public services like education or, or, or elsewhere, and many of those might sit in non-public sector services like, um, or the non-public sector like uh, employment and so on. So we know, for example, these are the uh, EIP services, uh, early intervention and early detection services can uh, save, uh, can be hugely cost effective. What they help to do is essentially reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. Um, uh, and the payoff there for the health service is pretty big, but there's also an enormous payoff uh, for uh, getting people essentially being able to get them back into work. Um, um, and be, being able to return to employment and education and training and so on. So what are some of the care processes um, available for people with um, serious mental illness and do these improve outcomes? So as we've said, one of the big challenges is actually getting, getting people that we know there's a treatment gap. So getting them into treatment early um, and improving access for such individuals. So we've done a bit of work looking at waiting time standards, which were introduced into the National Health Service for the first time for mental health in 2015. Um, and there was a, a new uh, two-week waiting, uh, waiting time target, which was in introduced specifically for EIP services. Um, and we investigated the impact of that 14 day wait uh, after the first six months of it having been introduced. So we compared um, patients under early intervention psychosis with standard care. Uh, we did a difference in difference model and we matched individuals. And then we analyzed the probability of waiting below the target. And we found, so this dark line uh, shows um, the EIP services and the dotted line shows the standard care services which were not subject to waiting time standards uh, targets and the probability of waiting we can see was much uh, higher for those on the EIP. Uh, we, we see that there's that, that sort of those two dotted lines are the sort of anticipation period when the, as, when the policy was first announced and then when it was introduced and we see, we see a significantly increased probability of waiting below target post policy. So it was, it seems to be the case that um, providers are responding in the same way as they do for physical, um, physical health uh, targets. We also looked um, at whether waiting times uh, have an impact on patient outcomes. And the patient outcome we used in this case was the Health of the Nation Outcome Scale score, which um, tends to be uh, used routinely for patients with severe and enduring mental illness in, in the UK. Um, in this study, we controlled for baseline outcomes for previous service use and treatment intensity, and we have found that the longer waiting times were associated indeed with poorer outcomes, particularly those longer than three months. So we, we know then that patients um, uh, who experience long waits have poorer outcomes. Um, and so actually this uh, uh, incentive to try and improve access and waiting times is probably um, 
well a well targeted policy approach. We have then um, did a review um, of looking at what are the sort of quality of care indicators that are used for people with serious mental illness. Um, we did a systematic review and we look, we found sort of six key themes, if you like, of the sort of areas of quality of care that um, um, uh, are, are pertain particularly to people with SMI, although they may pertain to them um, uh, in, in both primary and secondary care, although we focused on, on primary care. Um, and we also focused on um, quality indicators that are sort of routinely, could be routinely measured. So the, the kind of six themes that we came up was coordination of care. So uh, how patients are seen by the same staff so that they don't need to re, uh, every time they go and see a practitioner, they don't have to restate their uh, history and so on every single time. Uh, substance misuse was another key area. Um, service and provision, uh, service provision access to care was another one. So waiting times, duration of untreated psychosis. Another big one was around medicines management. Another one was around uh, mental health assessment. And another one was around physical health care. So routine checks on things like blood pressure, BMI, hypertension and so on. So we did then a very big study trying to look at some of these quality of care measures and look at what the relationship between them is and a, a number of outcomes. So some of the ones we picked out were um, care plans. So care plans are about developing health and social care needs for the individual, making sure that their care is coordinated, that patient preferences are taken into account. Uh, so, for example, you, you uh, notice when uh, what the individual's signature relapse might be and uh, what, what they want to happen if they start uh, becoming unwell and so on. Uh, another one which we looked at was uh, annual physical health checks, making sure that things like lipids and BMI are routinely checked. Uh, another one was provider continuity, so seeing the same practitioner, and that was measured through the usual provider of care index. And another one we looked at was polypharmacy. So the concurrent use of more than two antipsychotics for more than 30 days. And we looked at whether these care indicators were associated with um, better or worse outcomes, i.e. did they reduce admissions, a &E attendances, re-entry into specialist mental health services, mortality and healthcare costs. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of the highlight, highline figures here of our results. So we found that care plans and annual reviews and um, high continuity of care measured through the UPC index um, all were associated with uh, lower levels of uh, A&E attendances. So this is the hazard ratio for A&E attendances. Care plans and annual reviews were associated with lower risk of SMI admissions, and all of them improved the risk of ambulatory care sensitive condition admissions. So these are admissions which should, in principle, be preventable through good quality primary care. Um, just This just summarizes a huge body of work, which uh, I won't go into great detail in. I've sort of summarized some of these ones for you already. We found that polypharmacy was not significantly associated with unplanned admissions or a &E attendances or mortality. Um, and we found that care plans, annual reviews and continuity of care all reduced costs. So better quality of care reduced cost, costs. Um, care plans reduce and a, annual reviews re reduce total costs as well as primary care costs. Um, but we didn't find that any of these actually reduced, reduced re-entry into specialist mental health services. And that be, may be because actually in some situations, being in secondary mental health services is not, a, is not necessarily a bad outcome. It might, be, it might actually be um, important for the individual to, to go back into secondary mental health care. So then we've followed up with a, a, a lot of work focusing in particularly on physical health checks. So policymakers have put a lot of emphasis on physical health checks for people with SMI. 
Um, um, these are actually incentivized through the quality and outcomes framework. So um, GPs are paid to um, uh, do physical health checks. In 2016, 2006 to 2010, this was um, financed through just a, a one composite annual review. Uh, and that was then broken down into component parts between 2011 to 2013. In 2014, some of these were withdrawn, uh, some of these measures, and in 2019, even more were uh, withdrawn, and, but BMI was reintroduced again. And then on the back of quite a lot of the work which we had pr done previously showing that actually physical reviews are important because they reduce costs, they reduce uh, utilization and so on, some of these were then reintroduced again. So this work was actually done for the policy research program. It's not, it has been peer reviewed, but it's not um, published yet, but we hope to publish it a little bit later this year. But we found that uh, for all physical health checks, um, the COF reporting deadline is actually one of the biggest predictors of receiving a physical health check. So in that period leading up to the um, the end of the financial year, that three month period, that is the highest predictor of you actually getting a physical health check. So for example, the, getting a BMI check increases by around 123%. Older age was also associated with a higher probability of getting physical health checks. Males had a lower probability of getting a BMI, a blood pressure, cholesterol and smoking check. Um, being from a more deprived area increased the risk of physical health checks for smoking and blood glucose and having more morbidities also affected the receipt of physical health checks. We then looked at whether um, following a physical health check you actually get the interventions which are um, required or prescribed, uh, for example, through NICE guidance and so on for the physical health checks. So, for example, um, if you have a BMI above 30, uh, you should ideally be referred to weight management services or get a referral for exercise therapy or get dietary or weight management advice or exercise advice. Um, if you have a blood pressure between, um, uh, I think it was 140 uh, and 90, uh, or over, sorry, over 40 or over 90 uh, diastolic, then you need one of these interventions and so on. Um, and Q-Risk here is, a, is an algorithm which calculates the individual's 10-year risk of having a, a heart attack or stroke. So we had a look at the in, whether in, individuals are actually getting these interventions following the physical health check. So we... Um, these are the number of patients in our cohort, um, and we found that um, the, the highest um, uh, interventions following a physical health check, the higher proportions were with individuals with elevated Q risk and who were smokers and who were, had a, a, who were diabetic, who had a, a, high, a high blood glucose levels as well. Um, and the uh, the uh, hazard ratios with those suggested that uh, males are more likely to receive interventions after a cholesterol check. Age was uh, would increase the probability of receiving an intervention after a BMI blood pressure or cholesterol check. Again, deprivation was significant. Um, we didn't find any evidence that the COF reporting deadline would more likely trigger interventions. Um, but we did find, which is a good thing, I think, because you, you want those interventions to follow regardless of whether you're at the end of the financial year or not. Um, and certain morbidities also increased the probability of interventions occurring. We then uh, did uh, what I think was quite a neat little difference in difference model to try and capture the difference um, of when these um, when these interventions came into, um, when they were removed uh, and when they were reintroduced. So we, kn we know that um, BMI and cholesterol checks decreased significantly in the year of their removal. So in 2014, we can see um, those, those significant drops for them over that um, 
gray shaded area. Um, and then blood pressure, which was which remained part of the quaff throughout, um, remained relatively stable over that whole period. Um, and um, so we so you can see yeah, in 2019, BMI was included again, and we can see, uh, not surprisingly, um, the BMI goes up again. So we've um, we, we've run the difference in difference model and just um, used it to try and explain um, relative to the um, blood pressure, which was not removed, um, we find significant uh, changes in, in, um, uh, in behavior as a result of the, the crop incentives coming in or out. So it does seem to suggest to us that uh, incentivizing GPs to undertake these activities does help in them actually happening. So these healthcare processes are important and they lead to better outcomes. So um, in this study, we looked at, as we said, we know that uh, SMI often is associated with comorbid conditions and that these interact and they can lead to poor outcomes for both. So we looked here at the SMI, at the healthcare processes for people with SMI and type two diabetes. And we found that they have much higher consultation rates yet, uh, and more frequent health checks, but yet there's still this increased uh, mortality risk. And we found that that's most likely the result of underdiagnosis of cardiovascular disease and poorer access to specialist care. So I'm just conscious that I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to race through this, but just to show these um, uh, elevated uh, probabilities, uh, risk ratios for uh, consultations and for health checks, um, as well as for emergency admissions, but yet we still have this um, higher mortality risk um, uh, for, for all cause and for cardiovascular disease. Um, we've done quite a little, lot of work now also around multimorbidity. So when individuals have more than one um, um, serious mental, uh, uh, long-term condition alongside SMI. And we know that uh, individuals have a much higher prevalence of having two or more, three or more, or four or more, or even more, five or more um, long-term conditions uh, relative to the general population. So we did uh, a study looking at multimorbidity and the patterns of multimorbidity because health systems are not always designed to care for individuals with these complex presentations. So we've, we looked at, we ran these latent class models looking at the clusters or the groupings of long-term conditions with similar disease patterns. Um, and we've identified five, five latent classes. So it does suggest that we need to move from these single disease care pathways to much more integrated care pathways. So the, the, the patterns that we found were, was a latent class of the dependency, um, cluster where um, we found uh, substance dependence and alcohol problems uh, loaded very strongly onto this first class. Um, skin disorders atopic loaded onto the atopic cluster. There was a pure effective cluster, there was a cardiovascular cluster, and then there was a complex morbidity cluster, which had a whole range of these um, conditions um, loading onto that final latent class. So I, I hope I have um, outlined to you why I think this is a really important area for us to, to focus on. Just a few final thoughts from me. Um, SMI, we know, leads to significant cost to society, to health services and individuals. There's significant challenges around access. Early intervention is important. We need to ensure high quality care um, and particularly so post-pandemic where the health services, I think across many healthcare systems are under increased strain. Um, and we need more high quality evidence on cost-effective interventions, but we also need a more joined up thinking in terms of some of these spillover costs and benefits across different um, uh, parts of the economy. And there are really big, bigger societal challenges here, <clears throat> thinking about socioeconomic inequalities, poverty, social fragmentation, living conditions, and environmental conditions as well. 